Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is this interesting and massive news around Facebook and really just truth. And if you've missed some recent shows, you know, we've talked about Facebook on the show recently, specifically about its recent decision to not remove posts made by politicians that violated the platform's rules, even if those posts contain false information. And you know, following that, a lot of people criticized that move, saying that the company was basically allowing politicians to just lie on Facebook. And the reason we're talking about this once again today Today is because those criticisms are now hitting exceptionally close to home for Facebook. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that Facebook employees had written a letter to Mark Zuckerberg and other top executives calling on them to change the policy. According to the Times, the letter was posted on Facebook Workplace, which is the company's internal communication board for employees and has been there for two weeks now. And according to multiple sources, as of Monday, more than 250 employees had signed the message. And in this letter, the employees say that Facebook is a place of free expression, but that they are worried that the policy would undo all the work that they've done since the 2016 election to fight misinformation writing, free speech and paid speech are not the same thing. Our current policies on fact-checking people in political office or those running for office are a threat to what Facebook stands for. We strongly object to this policy as it stands. It doesn't protect voices, but instead allows politicians to weaponize our platform by targeting people who believe the content posted by political figures is trustworthy. They then go on to say that they believe the policy has the potential to increase distrust on the platform and adding, it communicates that we are okay profiting from deliberate misinformation campaigns by those in or seeking positions of power. And continuing that the policy could undo integrity product work that the teams had done to prepare for the 2020 election, and adding that this policy has the potential to continue to cause harm in coming elections around the world. And the letter doesn't kind of just object or complain, it also outlines six proposals for improvement, which include holding political ads to the same standards as other ads, stronger design for political ads so people can distinguish them as ads, restricting political ads from being targeted to custom audiences, observing election silence periods for all elections around the world, also setting joint ad spending caps for both politicians and PACs, and finally making clearer policies for political ads if Facebook does not change its current policy. Things such as updating the way that they are displayed so that it's clear that Facebook policies for fact-checking and misinformation do not apply to that content. With the Facebook employees closing this letter, saying that they want to have an open dialogue and see actual change, and that they are, quote, looking forward to working towards solutions together. Okay, so that's the letter, and it's a really big deal for a few reasons. First of all, it shows that even some of the people who work at Facebook are opposed to the company's political speech policy, and so much so that they're willing to speak out. And that, in of itself, is massive because internal resistance at Facebook is pretty damn rare. And you know, when you're looking at a company that is just as massive as Facebook, it's very easy to just kind of look at it as this one giant blob rather than a collection of people with different opinions. And as many others have pointed out, you know, Facebook has not usually been included in the recent wave of internal revolts and protests at other big tech companies like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. You know, places where employees have held mass protests against their company's impact on climate change, sexual harassment policies, and contracts with military and law enforcement bodies. I mean, notably at Amazon, Jeff Bezos announced that he would accelerate the company's climate goals back in September, and that after Amazon workers who for years had pressured Bezos to do more to address the company's carbon footprint planned a 1,700 worker walkout. But, you know, with Facebook, it's publicized, you know, they have a strong sense of mission and a tight-knit corporate culture among its rank and file employees. So, you know, dissatisfaction among employees is rarely put into public view. And as I think Vice rightly points out, most of the time that we've seen employee activism at Facebook, it's often tacked on to other activist movements at other companies. Right? And the reason it's important to note that is it just shows how divisive this policy is at Facebook. And following this letter getting out there in the world, we saw a number of people support the employees, with politicians like Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez applauding the Facebook employees' efforts, writing on Twitter, courageous workers at Facebook are now standing up to the corporation's leadership, challenging Zuckerberg's disturbing policy on allowing paid, targeted disinformation ads in the 2020 election. We also saw several senators chiming in, like Elizabeth Warren, who tweeted, Facebook's own employees know just how dangerous their policy allowing politicians to lie in political ads will be for our democracy. Mark Zuckerberg should listen to them, and I applaud their brave efforts to hold their own company accountable. And those reactions of course, not surprising. Both AOC and Warren have been arguably some of the most vocal critics of the new Facebook policy. You know, like we talked about before, we saw Warren run a fake ad that said Zuckerberg had endorsed Trump in the 2020 election, but that ad going on to say that this is not true. But what Zuckerberg has done is given Donald Trump free reign to lie on his platform and then to pay Facebook gobs of money to push out their lies to American voters. And when it comes to AOC, I mean, just last week, while questioning Zuckerberg at a congressional hearing, there was this clip that went viral. Could I run ads targeting Republicans in primaries saying that they voted for the Green New Deal. Sorry, I, I, can you repeat that? Would I be able to run advertisements on Facebook targeting Republicans in primary saying that they voted for the Green New Deal? I mean, if you're not fact-checking political advertisements, I'm just trying to understand the, the bounds here. What's fair Congresswoman, game? 
I, uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. You probably. don't know if I'll be able to do that. I think probably. Um, and in fact, since then, a pack run by Adriel Hampton, a political activist who owns a marketing firm in San Francisco, actually tested what AOC was describing, running an ad that spliced together audio clips of Senator Lindsey Graham so it sounded like he was saying that he supported the Green New Deal. And there, Facebook later said that it had removed that ad. Although, it's believed that's probably because PACs and independent organizations are not individual politicians, so the policy exempting political figures does not apply to them. But that's not where Hampton's efforts stop. Just yesterday, Today, Hampton himself registered as a candidate for governor of California. But it appears that he's not running to try to make the world a better place to be the best governor for California. Instead, it's just so he can run false Facebook ads. And while speaking to CNN, Hampton said, the genesis of this campaign is social media regulation and to ensure there is not an exemption in fact checking specifically for politicians like Donald Trump who like to lie online. I think social media is incredibly powerful and adding, I believe that Facebook has the power to shift elections. But ultimately, that is where we are with this story right now. You know, moving forward, it's gonna be really fascinating to see if other politicians respond with similar tactics like running ads with just blatant lies. Also, it'll be interesting to see if we see other people run for office just so they can do the same. Also, I mean, as far as what Facebook does from here, so far they have responded to the letter with a spokesperson saying in a statement, Facebook's culture is built on openness, so we appreciate our employees voicing their thoughts on this important topic. But then adding, we remain committed to not censoring political speech and we'll continue exploring additional steps we can take to bring increased transparency to political ads. But like I said, we're gonna have to wait to see if anything happens here if any of the pressure both internally and externally will get to Facebook. And of course, connected to this story, I would love to know your thoughts. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by SeatGeek. And for those that don't know, SeatGeek is the fantastic ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets for all kinds of live events, from concerts to comedy shows to sporting events. They put all the tickets in one place. They give them zero to 100 scores so you know if you're getting a good deal or not. I have the app on my phone and it is by far the easiest way to shop for tickets to whatever, whether it be a last minute date idea, a birthday, or holiday present, maybe just something for you. You know, the gift of an experience is awesome. Go to a concert, a comedy show, of course, football season, the NBA, of course, has just started up. Hell, they even have great finds on Broadway, but the main point is if you wanna check this out, you wanna try it out, just head on over to SeatGeekPhil.com or just click that link in the description, and when you use code Phil, you will get $20 off your first ticket purchase. So click it, check it out, use the code, save, and enjoy. And the first bit of awesome today is if you're looking for more news or just something interesting, we did a deep dive on Chernobyl and nuclear fallout. It's definitely worth a watch after today's show. Then, oh my God, I'm so excited. We've got the official trailer for The Mandalorian. Very excited for specifically that, but also just really interested to see what these Disney Plus originals are like. Then we had Carrie Washington breaking down her career from Ray to Django Unchained. We had Dove Cameron hijacking a stranger's phone. Then Netflix gave us a behind the scenes for El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. Ted Ed gave us Claws vs. Nails. Jimmy Kimmel gave us three ridiculous questions with Nick Offerman. Then we got the newest episode of the Shane Dawson doc, The Failure of Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson. Then we got the Honest trailer for The Shining. We're binging with Babish, giving us glazed pork chops from Apex Legends. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then, albeit a quickie, let's talk about the massive news coming from the NCAA. You know, on past shows, we talked about California's Fair Pay to Play Act, a bill that will allow college athletes in California to be paid for their image, their name, their likeness. Right, when this was happening, there were a number of people saying, you know, this is forcing colleges to pay athletes. That, that's not what it was. And of course, in the build up to the signing of the bill and after the signing of the bill, you had the NCAA saying, well, one, if this goes through, they might have to take away California college's eligibility in the NCAA. And while there was a lot of support for this bill from athletes, former athletes, you also had some exceptions like that of Tim Tebow. But the reason we're talking about this today is according to reports, the NCAA's Board of Governors voted Tuesday to allow college athletes to receive compensation for their names, images, and likenesses. With Michael V. Drake, the board's chair and president of The Ohio State University, saying in a statement, we must embrace change to provide the best possible experience for college athletes. This modernization for the future is a natural extension of the numerous steps NCAA members have taken in recent years to improve support for student athletes, including full cost of attendance and guaranteed scholarships. Are you really trying to take credit for this? What we're really seeing here is California stood up to the NCAA and said, hey, you greedy fucks, let's strip back some of the ownership you feel you have on these young athletes who are putting their, their, their minds and their bodies on the line every week because what you're doing is predatory in nature and in this game of chicken, the NCAA swerve. But because that quote really feels like you want it, I guess props 
for making the right decision even though you seemingly were forced to. One, so the inevitable was less painful for you, and two, so you could seemingly try to save face and take ownership of this positive change. But also, I do want to note, technically, as of right now, no change has been implemented. There are guidelines that the NCAA says any changes to name and image rights rules should follow. And per the NCAA statement, any changes made to the rules would be implemented January 2021, but it's not in place yet. And notably, on the NCAA's website in the questions and answers on name, image, and likeness section, which says it was updated today, the NCAA still views the action taken by California as likely unconstitutional. And regarding the question that they ask themselves, is the NCAA challenging it in court? They say the NCAA is closely monitoring the approaches taken by state governments in the U.S. Congress and is considering all potential next steps. Right, and so that fine print BS leaves me skeptical. But, you know, we'll see, time will tell. And then let's talk about this really interesting situation and debate and scandal around Katie Hill's resignation. This is a really messy story. I was looking online, there's also a lot of confusion around this story. So we're gonna try and break down what actually happened here, what happened when, what it means for Hill, for politics, and women in general. Right, so Katie Hill is a 32-year-old Democratic representative from California, and this is her first term. And notably here, she actually defeated the incumbent Republican Steve Knight in last year's midterms. Right, and this is a massive deal, and uh, I know that if you're unfamiliar when you think of California, you probably just think all blue districts. Not the case. Hill's district had actually been Republican controlled since 1993. Right, so it was massive news when she flipped that seat. But the reason we're talking about Hill today is not this ultra belated, uh, wow, can you believe it happened story. It's about what we've seen happen over the last month. And it all starts earlier this month. You had a right wing political blog publish allegations that Hill was in a three way relationship between her husband and a female staffer. It then went on to make another allegation, this time that she was having an affair with her legislative director. Also, to note here, Hill and her husband were reportedly estranged at the time of the second allegation, with Hill actually calling her estranged husband abusive and saying that he tried to humiliate her. However, there's actually another aspect of this story because the blog didn't just make allegations of inappropriate relationships. It was followed up by also including private text messages and even nude photos of Hill in that story. Which, for the record, those photos were somewhat censored, but for a lot of people, that wasn't the point because the blog still published those photos without her consent. And regarding those photos, Hill has actually implied that she thinks that her husband might have supplied those photos to the blog. Right, so after that, Hill went to the US Capitol Police who opened an investigation to find out who leaked the photos. But on October 23rd, the House Ethics Committee announced that it would also open an investigation. But this one focused on whether or not Hill had that inappropriate relationship with her legislative director. And of note here, right, one of the things is that if they found the allegation to be true, even if it was consensual, Hill would be guilty of violating a new ethics rule passed by Congress last year. A rule prohibiting members of Congress from engaging in sexual relationships with their aides. And what we ended up seeing that same day is that Hill sent out an email to her constituents. In it, she admits that she had an inappropriate relationship with a female staffer, but also noting that it had happened before she became a congresswoman, which is why that allegation was not part of the ethics investigation. Hill then denied having an affair with her legislative director and promised to cooperate with the investigation. But then this story took another massive turn on Sunday when Hill tweeted, it is with a broken heart that today I announce my resignation from Congress. This is the hardest thing I have ever had to do, but I believe it is the best thing for my constituents, my community, and our country. With Hill also sharing the photo of her official resignation letter reading, this is what needs to happen so that the good people who supported me will no longer be subjected to the pain inflicted by my abusive husband and the brutality of hateful political operatives who seem to happily provide a platform to a monster who is driving a smear campaign built around cyber exploitation. And continuing, having private photos of personal moments weaponized against me has been an appalling invasion of my privacy. And following that up by calling the action illegal and saying we are currently pursuing all of our available legal options. And a lot of this debate has been focused on that aspect, on cyber exploitation, or as it's more commonly known, revenge porn. Right, because you have people essentially arguing, politician or not, ultimately what you have is a blog leaking Hill's nude photos without her consent. And also, notably in California, revenge porn is illegal. Like we've seen with other stories where people have had their nude photos leaked without their consent. We saw a number of people criticizing the person in the photo, saying if you don't want things leaked, then don't be in the photo. You know, we saw people like Greg Gutfeld on The Five on Fox News saying things like, The fact, the reason why this story is big, unfortunately, is because there were visuals. There were pictures. And when you have pictures, you get the Daily Mail, you get TMZ, you get Drudge, right? Because that's, and unfortunately those pictures were leaked after an erotic adventure went awry. I mean, everything was having, everybody was having fun and then when it breaks apart, that's why you don't take pictures. That's the moral lesson here. But on the other side of this, you had people like Senator Kamala Harris saying that Hill is actually the victim of a double standard for female politicians. And of Hill, she said she respected her decision to resign, but also said it was clearly meant to embarrass her. There's so much that people do about women and their sexuality that's about shaming them. Right, and what she said there is also another big point that people have focused on here. Right, you have people saying you have this rising congresswoman, a woman who says that she was in an abusive relationship, her nude photos are leaked, you have allegations of a consensual affair, and suddenly she finds herself being forced to resign as the whole 
whole story blows up and makes front page news. Which one, some places have highlighted Hill's resignation as another generational issue. With the New York Times pointing out that lawyers and activists have said that you know these new kinds of internet exposure could impact a whole class of rising politicians. But we ultimately are where we are. We have Hill saying that she'll resign. Also, it appears that Hill already knows her next move after she formally resigns. Yesterday, announcing that she was vowing to fight revenge porn. There is one thing that I know for sure. I will not allow my experience to scare off other young women or girls from running for office. For the sake of all of us, we cannot let that happen. I'm hurt. I'm angry. The path that I saw so clearly for myself is no longer there. I never claimed to be perfect, but I never thought my imperfections would be weaponized and used to try to destroy me and the community I've loved for my entire life. But yeah, ultimately that's where we are with this story. You know, one of the key things with this story, and I've actually seen it used for kind of completely opposite reasons, is the mentioning of a double standard. You know, you have some people making the claim that it only got this bad because you're talking about a female candidate, also same-sex relations. But also at the same time, on the other side of this, you have some people saying, yes, there is a double standard, but they argue that Katie Hill is actually being treated better because she's a woman. The people and the media would hit way harder for, let's say, a male candidate with a greater focus on a male candidate's use of his position of power in a relationship with someone beneath him, whether it be with allegations while that person was a representative or on the campaign trail. But yeah, it, it's been really interesting to, to watch the fallout from this, the debate that has stemmed from it, and of course, I, I pass the question off to you around this. What are your thoughts on this situation in general? Do you believe there is a double standard here? If so, what kind? But yeah, any and all thoughts around this, I'd love to see in those comments down below. And that's where we're going to end today's show. And hey, if you're not 100% filled in, you should definitely check out that brand new deep dive we put out today, or maybe just miss yesterday show you want to catch up you can click or tap right there to watch either of those but with that said of course as always my name's philip defranco you've just been filled in i love yo faces and i'll see you tomorrow